<laughs> Good morning, church, and blessed Lord's Day. Uh, open your Bibles with me, whether on a physical or on your phone, to Genesis 29, uh, verses 1 through 30. That's where we'll be today, Genesis 29, 1 through 30. We're going to be continuing our walk verse by verse through the book of Genesis this week as I have the honor uh, of preaching God's life-giving word to you all today. And so, as we always do, we're going to read the text, I'm going to pray, and then, Lord willing, I'll unfold God's word to you. So, Genesis 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said to them, Is it well with them? Uh, They said, It is well. And see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered together. What are the sheep? And go, pasture them. Um, But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together, and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. Uh, The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, is it better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man? Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is complete. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in her Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. Would you pray with me, church? Yeah, God, we just thank you for this moment, Lord, to attend to the preaching of the word, Lord. I pray that you would just, um, yeah, give me the strength to preach through this, Lord, and that you would speak, God, um, through me, a very flawed man, God, um, and we thank you that your grace it works through very flawed instruments, God, and we just pray that, um, yeah, this text may be opened up rightly, God, and that it might feed your sheep, Lord. We love you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So, as we get into the text, it's important to sort of look at um, how we got to this point in the book of Genesis to sort of contextualize the passage that we just read through. So we started in Genesis with the beginning, with creation, God's good creation that was stained and marred by the evil of the fall of man, which brought forth sin and death into the world. But God did not leave the world condemned, but gave it hope 
through a promise in Genesis 3.15, that great text in which we see the promise of a coming seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. And ever since the fall of man in Genesis 3, we've been walking through and seeing how God is working out that promise, first through his servant Abraham, then through his servant Isaac, and now through his servant Jacob. But looking back at the life of Jacob, we've seen that he's not really been living a righteous life when we're introduced to him. He's been deceiving. He's been deceptive. He's almost sort of like a serpent in and of himself, despite being of that promised line. Though God chose him to be of that part of the promised line. As a result, we are where we are. Jacob had to flee from his home after stealing his brother Esau's birthright and blessing, um, also to search for a wife from uh, his mother's brother's family, Laban, in the region of Haran. And despite Jacob's unfaithfulness, we saw last week in Genesis 28, God's faithfulness to those whom he chose. Um, As God appeared to Jacob, reiterating that same covenant promise and blessing uh, that he gave to Abraham and to Isaac. And in response, we finally see the faithful obedience of Jacob as he offers a tithe and submission to God, who was empowered by the promise of God and the covenant to continue on his journey to search for the bride that he was sent to look for, which directly leads us to the main idea of our passage this week, which is, in the midst of your journey, trust in the promise and provision of God in all things. Say that again. In the midst of your journey, trust in the promise and provision of God in all things. And throughout our text today, we're going to see this develop in three ways for Jacob. Here are your three points, um, working on being a good Baptist. Uh, We see God provide in the journey, in the bride, and in the face of wickedness. So let's begin. First, we look at God's provision in the journey to Haran, specifically in the end of his journey to Haran. The text starts out with this word, then Jacob, which means whatever's happening now is as a result. It comes after what happened before, which we discussed was God's covenantal promise with Jacob. Um, it's because of the story before, because of the narrative before, that God was able, that Jacob was able to embark on his journey. The distance that Jacob had to travel from his home in Beersheba to Haran was something like 500 miles, which is a lot by foot, and it's not a 500-mile trek in the 2000s. It's in a desert with not much technology, that's a long time. But we see that Jacob is able to conclude his journey in verse 1. God had said he would be with him, and God was with him to Haran. But now he may be in the right place, but how does he know where to find the right family? He was here for a specific family. The text continues in verse 2, saying that he saw well in the field. Now, if you've been with us as we've been walking through Genesis, we've seen this motif of wells develop, and there's a lot of cool things in the Bible about wells and what it means, but for our case, wells sort of mean community, a place of permanent residence. You don't dig a well in the ground and then just leave it. Um, It's something that you go back to. It's a place that you live, and particularly seeing flocks of sheep waiting around there, he knows that there are people who live there who, you know, maybe he wasn't going to find Laban at this well, but Maybe you'll find someone that could point him to the right direction. On top of that, Moses gives us a particular detail on this well, that there's a great stone that sort of covers up the mouth of the well. And it's so large that the text sort of implies that several shepherds were needed to work to, un- to uncover the well, to roll away the stone so that the water may be accessed. It was only unrolled when all the flocks were gathered there, when all the shepherds were there. One man alone, it seems, could not roll away this stone. But the narrative continues, moving on from that stone, with Jacob speaking to the shepherds in verse 4. It's written, Jacob said to them, my brothers, where do you come from? They said, we are from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, we know him. He said to them, is it well with him? They said, it is well. Jacob is not only in the right place, He found people that know Laban, Rebekah's brother, just the man he's looking for. And not only that, the shepherds point out that, hey, over there, look, one of Laban's daughters, you know, you're looking for daughters, there's Rachel, one of his daughters, coming up with sheep. He came into Haran with a mission, and God was bringing it to fruition because of Jacob's faithful obedience as a result of the promise. We see the fruits of Jacob's journey here. Jacob found the right well. He found the right people, 
and soon we'll learn that he'll find the right daughter. But the text returns back to the matter of the well. It's not just going to bring up this thing about a great stone without going back to it. And Jacob offers the shepherd some friendly advice giving, uh, given the time of day. It's, you know, it's a bit hot here. Maybe it's time to water the sheep. Uh, but that large stone again comes up, preventing the shepherds from giving the sheep water until all the shepherds were there so that they could roll away the, the stone. And just as they were discussing these things, Rachel, one of Laban's daughters, comes up with a sheep she was tending to. So Jacob is now face to face with the bride that he looked for whom he journeyed from his dwelling for. And upon seeing Rachel, Moses records that Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. This was a stone that it took many shepherds to roll away. And Jacob, well, he saw a pretty girl. He rolled up his sleeves, puffed up his chest, and he just rolled it away. (laughs) Of course, we see in this story the time-tested tradition of impressing women by performing feats of strength like picking up as many chairs as possible to impress your church crush. (laughs) But this impressive show of strength is something that should be surprising to us, because if we remember when we were introduced to those two brothers, Jacob and Esau, um, it was Esau that was contextualized as that skillful hunter, that mighty man, and Jacob was sort of a man of the field. And yet, just as as it was not Esau that was of the line of the promise, but Jacob. It was not Esau's strength that God needed, but Jacob's strength, empowering Jacob to bring forth and unroll this stone, bringing forth life-giving water to the sheep. And, um, and I look at this text, and I wonder if it's sort of like a moment of supernatural strength on the part of Jacob. It really does seem like this is not a stone that can just be rolled away by one man, uh, which shows us something. Most of the time when God uses us. He uses our ordinary means. People are gifted in different ways. Some people are more friendly, some people are more intelligent, and God calls people in accordance with their ordinary giftings. But sometimes God just does something supernaturally and empowers us with grace. God is faithful. He provides the grace that we need to accomplish what he calls us to do. Do you believe that, church? Look to the examples of old and remember that our God is the creator of the universe. He can do anything. So if anything seems impossible and you're walking, remember that a little bit of faith can move mountains and accomplish what God wants to accomplish through you. Now, upon all these things, the text notes that Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. So he greets Rachel with a kiss. And this isn't a romantic one. Don't go kissing random people. Uh, This is the culture, uh, a friendly greeting. Um, who then runs to get Laban, who in the next verses receives Jacob warmly as his kin. And now, single men, this is the second story that we've seen um, people get brides at wells, so I don't know what you will do with that information, but I know where I will be next Saturday. (laughs) But more on that point, uh, there are fascinating parallels between this text and Genesis 24, that text that we saw Abraham sent his servant to find a bride, which ended up being Rebecca, for his son, Isaac. There are fascinating parallels between that text, and just to be good readers of the word, I leave that up to you to um, sort of look at, see the differences and similarities between these stories, to look at what Moses is getting at between these stories. But, returning back to our text, here we are at the end of verse 14. Jacob has made it to the place he was sent, faithfully trusting in God and seeing the fruits of such in the end of his journey. I mean, look back at verse 11. It notes that Jacob wept aloud after kissing Rachel. I know that after a particularly stressful week, finishing that all I can do can lead to a wash of just relief and emotion to come over me. And can you even imagine what Jacob was feeling? Maybe in the midst of that, you know, 500-mile journey in a desert, there were points where he was just struggling to keep going. He's far from home. His brother hates him. He doesn't even know if he's going to see his family whom he loves ever again. He doesn't know where he's going, where he's even been but his home in Beersheba. All he has is a promise to keep him going. And if we recall the context in which this text was written in, it's when Moses was leading the people of Israel in the desert, wandering around for 40 years because they were not allowed to enter into the land of promise. Seeing God's provision at the end of Jacob's journey, 
serves to show God's faithfulness to his promise. Jacob found what he was looking for. So too would the people of Israel if they, felt, if they lived in faithful obedience to God, and so, and so too will Christians if they walk by faith and trust in the promise in the midst of our long walks. And so, church, as you reflect on your walk, have you ever felt that the have you ever felt discouraged? Maybe God is leading you somewhere to some particular career path, to witness to a particular person, and so on, and you just feel tired after walking for so long without much fruit. Look to the example of Jacob and remember that God will provide on your journey. And he will use you for what he wants to accomplish through you. Your journey is the Lord's journey. And he will bring what he calls you to do to an end. So, turning back to our text. While the text hasn't explicitly said that Rachel would be his bride yet, it's pretty heavily implied by this point that Rachel is going to be the one. Um, So, surely, everything's going to be great between Jacob and Laban. We see in verse 14, he receives him quite warmly. But as we keep reading, we see cracks start to form as we get into our second point. So we know that Jacob was here in Haran for a reason. He didn't just decide to walk 500 miles for nothing. He was here to find a bride. And we see God's provision in the marital contract he enters into for Rachel. And that's our second point. That we see God's provision in the marital contract he enters into for Rachel. Upon the reception of Jacob into his home, Laban says, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? St. John Chrysostom, a 4th century church father, notes on this text, Notice, I ask you, how, someone, how when someone is helped by the hand from on high, everything goes favorably for him. You shall not serve me for nothing, Laban says. Tell me what your wages should be. In fact, this blessed man was acting out of love and was content simply to receive board and lodging and return him sincere thanks for it. But since Jacob demonstrated great humility, Laban took the initiative in promising to pay him whatever wage he named. Jacob was walking with God, and God provided him with the opportunity to ask for the bride he sought for, which, as we see the text unfold, the reader has gotten the sense that it's going to be Rachel. But... Moses, introducing some tension to us, introduces another daughter, Leah. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. So we get this notion. We have an older daughter, Leah, and a younger daughter, Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak. Whatever that means, it's a bit disputed. It's sort of supposed to tell us, hey, there's something in Leah that's undesirable to Jacob. And Rachel, being young and beautiful, is the one that he wanted. Um, And we see this notion of older and younger, which we've seen before in the book of Genesis, and it's going to come back to us uh, as this story unfolds. But despite the introduction of Leah, Moses notes that Jacob loved Rachel. And he, Jacob, said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, daughter Rachel. It was Rachel and not Leah whom Jacob set his eyes on whom he had loved. Rachel was the one that Jacob sought and undertook this 500-mile journey for. We see again God's provision for Jacob's trust in the promise. The promise, as it was for Abraham and Isaac, also did include numerous physical um, descendants, being like the dust of the earth. That's a lot of grandchildren. And God had set before Jacob a woman that he loved. To have children, you need that. Um, So, To seek after his bride, Jacob enters into a contract with Laban for Rachel's hand, pledging himself for seven years of labor under uh, under Laban for Rachel. Despite how long that is, seven years is a long time. I was 13 seven years ago, which is insane to me. Um, (laughs) Despite how long it is, the text notes that those years seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. He had already walked 500 miles for her. I'm sure he would have happily walked 500 more for her to be the man who walked 1,000 miles. (laughs) Motivated by the promise, attached with the goal of Rachel in mind, it's not just an abstract promise anymore. There's Rachel. There's the woman. Jacob faithfully undertakes in his labor for Rachel, seeking after the promise, being attended to by the God who provides for his people. So all is well, right? He completes the labor and gets his wife. Not exactly. 
and we see Jacob, who after Genesis 28 has actually been walking faithfully with the Lord, uh, despite the rough start at the beginning, he's actually been walking faithfully. He's done nothing wrong since Genesis 28. He's the one who ends up being cheated by the uncle who seemed to warmly receive him as flesh and blood. Which leads us to our third and final point. We see God's provision even in the wickedness of Laban against Jacob. We see God's provision even in the wickedness of Laban against Jacob. So, Jacob completes the work, and so, naturally, well, I guess it's time for my reward, uh, what I worked for. He says to Laban in verse 21, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is now complete. Well, I did the work, give me my bride. Note here that Jacob refers to her as my wife. Though not yet officially wed, by virtue of this marital contract that he entered into with Laban, Rachel was contractually his wife, and given that he did the work, it's, it was time for her, him to get married to her. And so Laban, seeing, yeah, we did have a deal, um, quickly undertakes to get everything ready for the wedding. It says, so Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. I can just imagine Jacob during this week, or during this time, just like, it's, he finally finished his work, and, you know, now he's just excited and longing for the union with the woman he loved. But we learn that, Jacob, that Laban did not intend to honor his deal. The text goes on and says, but in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Leah, not Rachel, was wed to Jacob. Jacob, the deceiver, had been deceived by Laban. And not only that, the text notes that um, he gives Leah a servant, which is sort of following the wedding customs of the time to give your newlywed daughter a, a gift of some kind, in this case a servant, which sort of serves as a foreshadowing to later stories involving this servant, Zilpah, but also just goes to show how little Laban cared about the deal he made. Congrats, you completed your labor. Here's the woman you specifically didn't work for. And to top off your happy matrimony, have a servant for her too. Now, we living today might just be a bit confused by Jacob in this part of the story. How could Jacob mistake Leah for Rachel when he had been you know, living and laboring seven years specifically for Rachel? But we have to remember that these aren't 21st century Americans. The wedding customs were different at the time, and the brides were traditionally veiled, only to be unveiled in the darkness of the wedding bed. But even with this explanation at mind, something just doesn't seem right to me with it. Once again, he'd been living and laboring in Laban's household for seven years, specifically for Rachel, and all it took was a simple veil for him to be deceived. He couldn't tell something was up by the way she talked, by just how she looked, something. It just doesn't seem right. And there's some irony in this that we'll unpack as we continue on to the last part of this passage. But it just seems like Jacob should not have been deceived. It seems silly. Now, if you're Jacob, and you just think you marry the love of your life, you know, the morning rays wake you up as the, and light up the room as you turn to your side, expecting that beloved bride that you worked for, but, as the text notes in verse 25, behold, it was Leah. You'd probably be a bit confused at first, you know, uh, what, what are you doing here? Um, and then probably a bit angry. And so Jacob, realizing what has happened, um, rightly rises up to confront Laban. And in verse 25, Jacob asks three questions to Laban. What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? We had a deal, Laban. I served seven years faithfully for Rachel, not Leah. What's up? Why did you do this to me? Laban, upon hearing the justified complaints of his nephew, answers him um, by completely ignoring the first two questions pretty much and giving him a pretty lame and subpar response to the third question. Moses writes, verse 26, Laban said, it is not done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Really now, maybe it would have been helpful to have known this seven years ago, um, that, hey, by the way, you're not going to get Rachel because of this custom, or like, I don't know, any day within that seven-year period, he didn't think it was important to bring that up. It's a pretty lame response. Um, 
And the deception and exploitation of Jacob's labor is kind of appalling. But at the same time, Laban's response, let's read that again. Um, It is not done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. That notion of younger versus older, it's something that's familiar in in the life of Jacob. And it's a moment of poetic justice, of great irony, given Jacob's life so far. Reflect back on the themes that I brought up and that we've been walking through in the book of Genesis, particularly that theme drawing from Genesis 3.15 of two competing lines of offspring, the line of the woman and the line of the serpent. This is rehashed again and again and again throughout Genesis. We see it in Cain and Abel, in Cain's line, in Seth's line, in the table of nations. We see it in Isaac and Ishmael, in Jacob and Esau. And Jacob, despite being chosen before his birth to be of this promised line of the seed of the woman, acts much more like a seed of the serpent. He comes out of the womb grabbing at the heel of Esau just as the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. He deceived Isaac so as to steal that blessing he intended to give Esau, much like the serpent deceived Adam and Eve to take away the blessing of Eden from them. However, with Laban, The tables are turned. The serpent found a bigger serpent. Uh, As Preston would put it, we have snake battles going on. Just as Isaac was deceived as a result of his poor sight, unable to see the face of Jacob, remember if we look back at Genesis 27, it really didn't make sense for Isaac to be deceived the way he did, and yet his poor sight deceived him. Jacob was deceived because he could not see the face of Leah, veiled by a simple covering. Jacob, the younger child who stole the older child's blessing, when he sought the younger bride, was given the older. The one named Jacob, which literally means he cheats, was cheated, much in the same way that he cheated his own brother and his own father. Ultimately, this leads one to ask, why does something like this happen to Jacob? Did not God promise to be with him? Wasn't he just like doing the right thing from then on? Like, yeah, he messed up before, but at least he has this faithful obedience now. Why did Jacob have to undergo this suffering? The reason is that God provides for his people through discipline. God provides for his people through discipline, and we see that here, church. Solomon in Proverbs 13, 24 notes that whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. How much more true is that of our everlasting Father? We see throughout Scripture that God uses discipline to bring His people to repentance and hold them accountable for their sins. And let's be clear here, when we're talking about God's discipline, what we're not saying is that God is punishing you like a judge for your sins, because Christ paid for your sins if you believe. Rather, being sinful children of God, we are very stupid And we do very stupid stuff, much like children. We are accurately likened to sheep, which are not the brightest of animals. And just as a parent will correct their child's mistakes through disciplining them, so too does God correct our mistakes through discipline. God provides through disciplining us. And Solomon wisely instructs us in in the text that we started our service today with by saying, My son, do not despise despise the Lord's discipline. Or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves whom he loves, as a father the son in whom he delights. It is because God loved Jacob, because Jacob was his chosen, that this deception happens to Jacob. Now, it's not that God is the author of evil or the author of this deception, but he uses evil for his glory. Does that mean that Jacob is going to be perfect all of a sudden? No, he's a terrible person. He messes up after this a ton of times. But we see God's hand on his servant whom he chose, holding him accountable for his sins with the rod of discipline and not judgment to move him to repentance and obedience. Once again, is he going to be perfect after this? No, but this is just one moment in God's workings with Jacob that he moves him to be a faithful servant. And as he held Jacob accountable for his sins and he disciplines Jacob, so too does God discipline us today, church. And as we reflect upon Jacob's deception and the wickedness that befell him, be encouraged by the Lord's provision in the midst of evil. 
as Joseph said to his brothers who sold him into slavery in Genesis 50, 20, which is a story that we might get to in 10 years. Um, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And so when we are thrown into dark storms, be encouraged by the example of Jacob. The Lord uses all things for his glory. Attend to his discipline with the loving obedience to your Lord. Where does this teaching find you, church? Have you ever seen the Lord's discipline in your life? Maybe God has given you something just to take it away. Maybe a particular sin that you wouldn't have wanted to come out did come out, embarrassing you. What do you do in reaction? Do you turn and repent, or do you run farther away from him? See the example of the Lord's discipline in Jacob and be comforted that God is transforming you into the image of Christ. Run to his arms in repentance to receive his grace. If he loves you, if he chose you, he will not let you go. It took him sending a whale to swallow Jonah for Jonah to learn this lesson. It might not take that for you, but um, it is important to attend to his discipline and to trust in it in the midst of the dark storms that God throws at us to grow us in repentance and obedience and love to him. Returning back to the text, despite this deception, God will not let his servant go without the bride that he sought for. Rachel was the bride. It was not Leah. Laban tells Jacob in verse 27 to complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. So to rectify the wrong, Laban squeezes another seven years of labor from Jacob. Um, And that's crazy, but Jacob being faithful is like, all right, whatever. Um, But I can imagine for Jacob that this week that he has to week, what does that mean? It's sort of like weddings were multiple days, and so like, hey, finish up everything with Leah, and then you can get Rachel. And so Jacob, I can imagine, like, despite the seven years he had to work um, for Leah, or for Rachel, uh, it said it felt like a few days to him. This seven-day period must have felt more like seven years than that seven-year period did. I mean, Laban already deceived him once. Who is to say he wouldn't do it again? But Jacob, faithfully waiting that week, finally is wed to the bride whom he sought. Our text for this day ends, verse 28 through 30. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. Jacob was finally joined to the bride whom he sought for from the beginning of his time with Laban. God had provided for Jacob the bride whom Jacob loved. Now, as we sort of close off this text. Things aren't all peachy for Jacob. He has seven more years of labor to undertake, which our next couple stories will focus on. And if we look at like the marital situation that's going on, you might be like, well, what's going on with this polygamy that's happening here? Because we know that God by no means approves of polygamy. It's contrary to his creational design for marriage between one man and one woman. Now, It's something in the Old Testament that God permits, but it's not something that he wants. It's something that's contrary to his design, and polygamy in the Bible always leads to problems for those who undertake it. We saw this with Abraham, and we see it again with Jacob, Jacob being a chief example of the problems with polygamy in the next few chapters. But in the midst of all this messiness, God will provide for Jacob with a large family, which is a blessing in and of itself, but this family would be 12 sons that turn into 12 tribes that constitute the nation of Israel, that physical descendant, that promise that he had promised to Abraham, uh, to Jacob, or, or to Isaac, and now to Jacob. God is faithful and provides in all circumstances to his people. As we saw he did to Jacob, he does to us today. And now as I read through this text, I couldn't help but be reminded of another man who came from his dwelling to search for a bride. As we look at Jacob in this text, we are reminded that Jacob is a flawed man living in a flawed world. And let Jacob cast your eyes to the true and better Jacob, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who took on flesh 
to come into our world to chase after his beloved bride, his church, um, whom he chose before the foundations of the world. An old hymn, which I love, goes, From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And just as Jacob, upon seeing the bride he sought for, rolled away the stone by immense strength, bringing forth water for his sheep, so too in the resurrection of our Lord, the stone which entombed his lifeless body had rolled away, bringing forth living water, which forever satisfies and satiates the thirst of his sheep, his elect. And just as Jacob had to labor for his beloved bride, so too did our Lord labor for his beloved bride. To, uh, in accordance with his obedience to the law and to the call of the cross, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, a labor that Jesus joyfully undertook, moved by the love of his bride, as Jacob was moved by the love of Rachel. And just as Jacob was wed to two wives, this confusing mess, so too can we look to Jesus in this. The story of redemption unfolds under two testaments, old and new, two covenants, old and new, Two peoples, Israel and the church. And though it was Rachel whom he sought, it was actually Leah who brought forth Judah, who would be uh, the line from which Jesus would come. And just so, Jesus, who sought after the church in his coming, Israel was not there for no purpose. Israel was there to bring about Jesus Christ. And though he was searching for his Rachel, he used his Leah to bring himself to us. He reconciled his new covenant people to himself, Jew and Gentile, the true Israel of God. And so as we bring this text to the close, where does Genesis 29 find you, church? If you are here today and you're not a Christian, first, we want to thank you that you came to Aletheia today. There are a ton of other things you could spend your uh, Sunday morning doing, and we're honored that you chose to spend your time here with us. We ask you to look to the story of Jacob and turn to the story of Christ, who came from his home, taking on flesh, living the life that we should have lived, and dying the death that we should have died. Christ rose from the grave in victory, crushing death and sin in a single blow, delivering his beloved bride from Satan to himself. He ransomed the church with his own blood. Christ died that his beloved could be redeemed. He took the punishment that he deserved because he loved you. And all you have to do is believe in him. As Jacob loved Rachel and labored for Rachel, so too did Christ labor for those who believe. There's no way that you can work your way to heaven. It's too much. You will fail. Instead of laboring yourself, look to the labor of Jacob and be moved to the labor of Christ. who said, it is finished. The labor and work is done and his yoke is easy. All you have to do is believe be joined to his people because he came for you. If that is at all something that you're interested in talking with us about, please do not hesitate to ask Rob or Brian or anyone here who knows and loves Jesus about Christianity, about the message of his gospel. And now if you are here today and you are a Christian, just take some time to praise God for our Lord who came for you, who loves you so much that he came for you. Never forget the redemption that we have in Christ and just as the covenant promise And the provision of our Lord moved Jacob in his journey and attended to Jacob in all parts of his journey. Trust in Christ. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith in all that you undertake in your Christian walk. God provides for his church. He didn't just come and leave us. No, he is actively with us. He actively provides of his church. Even in the midst of evil and wickedness, God uses these things to glorify himself and to grow us. He takes us through trials and confronts us with our sin so that we repent and are sanctified in him. He does not leave us in our sin. No, he sanctifies us and nourishes us, crafting us after the image of Christ. Receive his discipline with joy as you walk in faithful obedience to our loving Lord. Would you pray with me, church? God, we thank you for your word, Lord, for Genesis 29, God, and that You came, Lord. We thank you for the true and better Jacob, God, and that, um, yeah, Lord, you worked out redemption through flawed people, God, and that you are with us wherever we are, Lord, in our journey, God, and that you use all things to your glory and that you're constantly providing for us, Lord. 
I pray this message may just be on the hearts of us, Lord, as we go about our weeks and leave this blessed day, Lord, and that these truths might just be on our soul, Lord, that we are fed and nourished by them, Lord. Yeah, God, we love you, and we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.